Awesome, great. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thanks for, you know, having us today. Um, thanks for coming in. Buenos dias a todos. Thank you, thank you. Since it seems Good like day. it's already 10.02, we should probably get started. So thank you, everybody. Good morning. Next slide, please. So for today's agenda, today um, we'll welcome you and up, we'll update you on certain topics. Um, also, we will be discussing why adult ed enrollment, what is adult ed enrollment, what could an ideal partnership look like, and our closing. Next slide, please. Updates. Uh, we will update you on our past webinars. We've actually had 11 webinars. We actually started back in May. Um, our upcoming webinar. Our upcoming webinar will actually be on December 10th, same time. We will be on Guided Pathways, I believe, and dual enrollment. And then we will also have a link on the chat for moving to an electronic form. Um, you could check out the foundation updates on the foundation website. And you could also check out updates on the CVC OEI um, updates on their website as well. Next slide, please. And this is the COP team. You guys already know us just as a, it's a difference today because today Sherry Shojai will be in charge of our questions and our senior director, Naomi, is actually the Wizard of Oz with our slides. And then myself, Edith Flores, will be your facilitator. Next slide, please. And about COP, you guys already know the majority of you guys have been our several of our webinars and our, you guys know what COP is about. So we're always willing to help out whenever needed. Next slide, please. Chat. So this is very important. So if you guys have any questions, please, once the, the, our, our presenters are presented, please make sure that you're muted and your camera isn't on, but that you actually put your question in the chat. Your questions, a lot of your questions will be answered and asked by the, at the end of the presenters. Also, if you have any tech issues, please in the chat put tech and we will try to contact you and see what we can do to help with any tech issues. Next slide, please. And now this is the, our, our team from Chafee College. We have Laura Alvarado, the Assistant Director for Adult Education Pathways at Chafee College, and also Matt Morin, which is the Director of Intersegmental Partnerships at Chafee College. You guys take it away. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for coming out. This is great. I'm really excited about this. This is the first uh, presentation we've done with CLP on adult ed, dual enrollment, and uh, it's a really new space. Um, so let's move forward. Uh, first, today we'll be talking about um, sort of the why behind adult ed, dual enrollment, which has to do with uh, how many adults in California don't possess high school diplomas, how moving on transition for those adults is a true anti-poverty strategy, and it connects deeply to the equity ethic at the heart of dual enrollment. Um, which has been underrealized, and then also how this expands the space of college eligible students in, in credit to uh, students who are not AB 540 eligible, not in residence, undocumented students, and uh, how it accelerates transition for, for a population of students who really need it most. Next slide. So, I know for uh, a lot of the folks who might be in the room from the adult education space, this might be a slide that you're familiar with. It's the statistics you're from familiar with. I think many of us in higher education aren't as aware of how dire the crisis is um, in California, especially when it comes to the number of adults over the age of 25 who do not possess a high school diploma. It is 17% of the entire population of California adults over the age of 25 who do not possess a high school diploma, which is the highest percentage in the country. And given that California has the highest population in the country, it is an absolute crisis because that's over 5 million adults in the United States, uh, I mean, in California alone, who do not possess a high school diploma. The uh, magnifying uh, effects of that are this population of adults are also much more at risk for living below the poverty line, homelessness, um, and the other uh, effects of, of that low educational attainment. Next slide. So 
So how does this look in our educational pipeline? So of those 5 million adults, California's adult ed programming through the California Adult Education um, Program, CAPE, uh, reaches around half a million of that 5 million adults. So even uh, of the proportion of adults that don't have high school diplomas, the California adult ed programming still is only reaching a small major, a small portion of those, of those individuals. And that, and, and of those individuals who the California adult ed program reaches uh, that half a million, only 1.6% of those students who are in our pipeline, who are in our adult ed pipeline in California, that means they are pursuing a high school diploma or a GED, or maybe getting ESL, or uh, um, post-secondary or secondary CTE training. Maybe they're also uh, pursuing adult basic education. Those individuals of all of the entire pie, that half million that are served by the adult ed programming, either through non-credit programs at colleges or through adult school programs under K-12 districts, only 1.6% of those students ever attain more than six college units, which really identifies the crisis of transition because uh, not only do we start with an absolute uh, um, extreme poverty risk situation by the number of adults who don't have high school diplomas shown in the previous slide, but then of those adults who actually make it into programs that allow them to pursue secondary diplomas, only 1.6 of that entire pie end up transitioning over into completing even six college units. Next slide. So that's where dual enrollment comes in. And I think this crowd in this room right now is very familiar with the power of dual enrollment as an accelerator, as a transition strategy. There's tons of great research on this, especially from the Institute of Educational Sciences and CCRC, that students are more likely to graduate high school. They're more likely to enroll in college full-time, maintain higher GPAs, persist and complete. And then most importantly for this conversation, that the positive effects are proportionally greater for students who are first generation or low socioeconomic status, which is precisely that group of adults over the age of 25 who don't have high school diplomas and who are pursuing them through an adult ed program. Next slide. And here's the rub. Despite the potential for dual enrollment to be such an equity driver, still demographically across the country and in California, dual enrollment students tend to be white, high SES, high socioeconomic status, non-first gen, high GPA, and in AP IB programs. And so this is the traditional dual enrollment demographic, they, uh, the high school student demographic traditionally. So as an alternative to that, uh, as, as, a, as a move towards social justice, we tried to expand the umbrella of dual enrollment to include those students who could most benefit from the equity proposition of dual enrollment to include adults who don't have high school diplomas, um, which is a group that you really can't, you can't go wrong if you're talking about closing achievement or equity gaps. There's no way for these students to track into these higher domains where we end up doing the opposite of equity, which is currently what's happening statistically in dual enrollment because the, the, the wonderful power of the tool is still primarily serving those students who are more likely to go to college and succeed. Next slide. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Laura Alvarado. She is the Assistant Director of Adult uh, Education Pathways at Chafee College and uh, take it away. Tell us about SB 554. So oh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having us here today. So let's talk about what is adult dual enrollment. So let's discuss SB 554, CalPromise, partnerships and connections, and our campus structure and processes. Next slide. So what is SB 554? So this is the legislation that was passed last year. So it's been just over a year that allows our college campuses to operate dual enrollment 
within our adult school campuses. So dual enrollment is basically somewhat of a replication of the high school dual, dual enrollment process, but allows it, us to apply it to adults. Next slide. SB 554 authorizes a student pursuing a high school diploma or a high school equivalency, such as a GED, to enroll as a special part-time admin student at a community college. Special part-time admin expansion to adults as in ASE programs. Next slide. So what does this mean for us in our adult schools? So this expansion, what's the difference between special part-time admin and using it versus CalPromise? So AB 2364 clarified that colleges can waive non-resident fees for part-time special admins and collect F FTE portions on those, that in on those enrollments. So let's talk about this for a second. One of the beauty of special part-time admin in the high school process was that the legislation said, you know what, we're gonna, these are minors here. We are not gonna ask them about their citizenship or residency. With SB 554, this same process applies to our adult school students. We are allowed to process our adult, our adult school students into the college system, taking co college credit courses. We do not have to ask for citizenship or residency. We have, there's a provision under AB 2364 that allows us to process these students, non-resident students, a special part-time admin, collect FTES apportionment on these students without asking for residency or, or citizenship, citizenship questions. That right there is a game changer. Second, Using SB 554 as compared to CalPromise does not start the transition piece on the student as a first time college student. Students can use SB 554, take courses as part time students. When they do transition as full time students, they can then start the clock on CalPromise and potentially enroll as full time students and enroll for free using their CalPromise and eventually Pell. Colleges receive enhanced apportionment for special part-time admins. Under the 2021 budget, enhanced apportionment for special part-time admin students is at the $5,621 rate as compared to base, uh, uh, the base in apportionment. And SB 554 encourages strong partnerships with adult ed programs. So within this partial partnership, very similar with dual enrollment. Our partnerships, they also are part of the process of approving the courses and uh, approving that the students enrollment. So when we build this partnership with the colleges, with between the colleges and the adult schools, it's truly a partnership. We engage strongly with our adult schools. So these programs build on the students of being enrolled on the handoff on building the community and it creates an even stronger partnership between the student and between the community. What we're finding is the students are transitioning over. We're building stronger uh, a sense of belonging. The students are performing better because we're being able to support them not only in the classroom, but with ed plans, with counseling, with tutoring. Um, and overall, the student is performing better. Next slide. So what could an ideal partnership look like? We're gonna hand this off to Sherry. There are a number of questions in the chat. So maybe we could take a pause, take some of those questions before we go into the um, aspirations. Yeah, so the first question that was posed was, could those people have GEDs and what percentage? And I think that was while Matt was speaking. Yeah, so um, the, uh, 
Yeah, so absolutely. A student could be pursuing a GED or a high school equivalency at any percentage. That's not indicated anywhere in the law. The law is very broad that way. Um, as long as the adult ed provider who has connected that student to the GED prep program is signing off on that student's uh, pursuance of the GED, then that counts uh, for the college purposes and for audit purposes to, uh, to, to clear that student for special part-time um, enrollment and for the college to waive the fees for that student, absolutely. That, um, the next question is, so the students can live across our state border and if they don't have a high school degree, we can waive their tuition. Do they have to be enrolled in an adult ed program and getting dual enrollment credit to have that benefit? Yeah, so because it's a California law, so and this would, this would definitely need a, a firmer legal interpretation. I'm just going to take a shot at it. But because, okay, so here's my guess, that because it's a California law and it requires the adult ed provider's signature, that adult ed provider would have to be part of the California system. And therefore, uh, it, the student could not be enrolled in an adult ed program that was across state lines. Um, the, same per, the same interpretation would apply to traditional dual enrollment high school students in California. So maybe Naomi uh, had some information about that. I'm not quite sure if traditionally aged high school students who are, who are in high schools outside of California are allowed to enroll as special part-time admits, but I don't think they are. This is Naomi. Uh, I, I actually don't know if that's ever come up and my I would imagine that would not be the case. Yeah. Oh, and Kelly in the chat says they need to be enrolled in a California program. I think that's correct. All right, so uh, the next question that we have is, does the dual enrollment replace or defer the need to fill out CCC apply? And then somebody said CCC apply is still required, but just want to clarify. Yeah, so actually CCC apply is not required for any college by law, um, but most colleges use CCC apply and are, you know, for their traditional dual enrollment programs. Uh, likewise, they could use this uh, CCC apply for adult ed. However, if a college wanted to create their own application with the Title V requirements for what's needed for student information in their student information system, they totally could do that, just as many colleges do for their non-credit um, programs, as well as for their adult ed programs. Uh, for I mean, sorry, for their non-credit programs. And I think some colleges don't even use CCC Apply for their credit students. Is that correct? Um, nonetheless, uh, a college could create their own application uh, in their adult ed division that allows students to enroll a special part-time admits on the credit side if they coordinated that with their instructional credit division. Thank you, Matt. We have a lot of questions. So um, the next one is, and I think this was directed towards someone in the chat, uh, towards Jane, but it's where can we find the language at SB5 54 is expanded to all C, C -cap or C -A -E -P programming, not just students enrolled in HSD slash HSE. Great. Thank you, Sherry. Um, I wanted to just quickly, uh, I see that CCC, someone wrote CCC applied just regarding that previous question is required by most colleges now. I just want to clarify that um, uh, whether CCC apply is required by a college is at that local level, but whether or not it's required by the state of all colleges is a separate issue. So um, if, at the, if your particular college makes a determination it will move away from CCC apply or not have CCC apply for certain, uh, for certain programs like adult ed or like special part-time admit, that's gonna be a local decision. Um, and so to the question that Sherry just so, uh, mentioned, which is about does SB 554 apply to all adult ed programming that's CAPE funded? The answer to that is no, um, at least in its current state. So 
SB 554 pretty explicit, is pretty explicit that it applies only to students who are in adult ed high school equivalency or high school diploma programs. Um, and the reason for that is SB 554 doesn't do much to build ed code on its own. It actually just ties itself to the current special part-time admit legislation, I mean, special part-time admit ed code that exists for minors. And so therefore, there's nothing in that ed code for minors that is tied to anything other than pursuing a secondary credential. So if you were to open that up to all CAPE funded programs by, by your sort of legal logic there, you would be actually opening up a space for all adult ed CTE, all adult ed um, uh, ESL, and students who are not, who may already have high school diplomas. And in traditional special admit ed, ed code, traditional special admit students are not allowed to enroll under that designation if they already have a high school diploma. They move into first, co first time college student designation. So uh, I think that's an area, I know a lot of our adult ed folks are really rightfully pretty disappointed about that re uh, restriction, but we really need to look at it as this has opened up a new channel that didn't exist before. Um, sure, it's not like the entire world. It's not like we opened up the, we were able to open up the entire, uh, the skies and the heavens for it, but the, the legislators definitely would not have gone for a law that would have opened up all CAPE funded programs to the credit side because uh, it would have um, really radicalized and overturned AB 540. And that's a key, that's a key component there that if we had opened up all CAPE funded programs to credit for non-residents and residents, then that would have overturned AB 540, which most of us, if you're social justice minded, would be totally in favor of, but know that that's not a politically, that's not a politic, that's not an easy political arrow to shoot. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> there was another question on who signs off, the director of the adult school, teacher at the adult school? Not sure what they were saying, who signs off of what, but if you're able to answer that. Yeah, absolutely. So in the Ed Code uh, for Special Part-Time Admit, this is the same mm -hmm. uh, signatory kind of interpretation uh, as we have for traditional high school students, which is that the Ed Code says the governing board um, uh, of, a, of a school district of the, of the K-12 district, um, or in this case, the adult ed program or designee. And so you, so you can have that designee be an administrator or sometimes it's counselors at the K-12 district or at the adult uh, ed program. So, we bas so it's basically opened up that designee to uh, any of the individuals at the adult school or college adult ed program that the district uh, determines um, will hold that, that role. So counselors, uh, assistant principals, principals, sometimes career techs, mm -hmm. it could be a wide range of classifications. All right. Um, so you have a bunch of questions, so I'll just keep, keep them going. Um, is there a list of community college classes that cover high school diploma requirements? Yeah, that's an exciting uncharted territory. Uh, the, the way this works is exactly the same as it works in traditional dual enrollment, which is that the determination over which courses at the college can be articulated for core high school graduation requirements are gonna be locally determined in the K-12 district's board policy or in that college board policy if they're running an adult secondary ed program. Now, those will have to be in line with uh, state and national guidelines for secondary, for secondary ed diplomas, of course. And then um, uh, regarding um, the, well, I, I guess the issue regarding um, CSU, UC, A through G is, is a separate issue, uh, but at least for the adult ed programs, um, articulation of core requirements, that's gonna be done at the local level. 
All right. Um, another question was, so for clarity, this applies to students taking ESL at adult schools? It does not, unless no. those ESL students are pursuing a high school equivalency or high school diploma. Oh, so yeah, that question, if they are pursuing yes. HSE prep, um, then absolutely. We've actually, what we're doing is many of our adult schools are using if they're if they're ESL students, uh, many of our ESL students have their high school credential from their home countries, but they don't possess that here in the United States. So um, they're encouraging their ESL students to enroll in a GED program at their adult schools. So they then will be eligible to participate in the uh, adult dual enrollment program. All right, another question is, can students within dual enrollment for SB 554 have their units covered towards SB 68 eligibility attendance requirements? All right. <laughs> Laura, you wanna take that one? So will they be able to repeat the question, please? Sure. Can students within dual enrollment for SB 554 have their units counted towards SB 68? eligibility attendance requirements? Yes, they can. Yes, and so there's XP. Can... Yeah. Go ahead, Matt. No, no, you go for it. Yes, so absolutely. So the adult school hours, so obviously they have to be dual enrolled. So the hours that they're attending the adult school will count towards those 420 hours on the adult school side. And then the units that they're taking at the college will count towards those 24 units or those unit requirements for the, uh, the that meet the requirement for the uh, college site. And then moving forward, that's an area that we want to look at in, in addressing a lot, along with Neil Kelly and another board group on looking at that legislation to see how that can be altered to make it more reasonable because those 420 hours that are required for SB 68 um, are, are not really applicable because they're so excessive. It's so difficult for an adult school student to meet that 420 hours. And even on the college side to meet those 24 hours for year, uh, it's too expensive for that student to meet that at the full rate. So that's something that does need to be addressed as well, long-term. Go ahead, Matt, you were gonna make a comment? No, no, that, that's exactly what I was gonna say, is there's, there's more work to be done on SB 68, for sure. Cause it's mm -hmm. still, even if we count it in that direction mm -hmm. towards, for a, to move us towards um, eligibility for an undocumented student into first time college student status, it, you know, it's still too high of a bar. Right, it would make sense. So what, what SB 68 says that a, an adult school student can use 420 hours of adult school attendance to meet one year of eligibility, similar to an AB 540. AB 540 allows a student to use secondary or post um, elementary or secondary three years to have residency, so they would pay $46 a unit. But an adult school student would have to have 40, 420 hours, which is the equivalent to a, a traditional high school student. But it's, it's not apples to apples. So it would make more sense to make it equivalent. So equivalent of a year, which would make me more in line with how an adult school student would work, their equivalency. So that's something that we can look at moving down with some policy just to make it more applicable and make it more accessible for an adult school student. Thank you. <clears throat> Laura, somebody asked for your email address if you <laughs> want to share it. Um, Thank you. The next question, is there a limit on the number of semester students are duly enrolled in adult ed non-credit and other credit college classes? There is not. So no. um, it's, just, uh, it's just an open space in the ed code, actually. And I'm kind of happy with that. Can these adult ed slash non-high school diploma students enroll in ESL? Oh, I think we already covered that, but I don't know if you wanna. Yeah, just to clarify again, um, yep, yeah, if 
ESL is all good if they're pursuing a uh, an adult secondary ed um, diploma or equivalency, but not if uh, if but but that needs to be kind of part of part of their pathway. And just just a follow up is is it allowable to enroll a high level ESL student in an HSE prep to create the eligibility for five fifty four? Yeah, that's what I love, right? Those braided programs. And that's really in line with the integrated educational uh, work that's going on, the IECL, uh, I, uh, the integrated educational um, ESL work that's happening right now. And so, um, so yeah, absolutely. And we actually are doing a program like that with one mm -hmm. of our adult schools where they're higher level ESL students are taking business communication courses and business writing courses at the college. Um, somebody asked, can a CCAP partnership agreement be established with an adult ed program? Um, I think Naomi answered, so adult dual enrollment is not eligible for CCAP. I would suggest a partnership create an MOU. Um, and then somebody asked if there's any templates that could be found. Yeah, so currently, so you actually technically don't need an MOU to admit a student as a special admit student um, for SB 554 or any other um, special admit student, but uh, but they but MOUs are always great because they help to outline sort of the ground rules of the partnership. Regarding CCAP, um, that is currently that's a no um, because. Yes, uh, that's a no because of the fact that CCAP specifically uh, uses the language of high schools um, and adult schools are not, are exist in a different space in ed code. And, but regard, but I know that the chancellor's office is interested in kind of looking at that um, and sort of seeing, all right, well, you know, like how, how might we move forward? Um, one of the big questions is whether or not a CCAP even makes sense. The only reason that I see a CCAP making sense for an adult ed partnership with, uh, with SB 554 is if you want students to be taking over 11 units. So if you want them to be enrolled in up to 15 units, that's where a CCAP would really make sense. You at your, at your local level, you could easily develop an MOU with your adult ed partners, either an adult school or, or even internally with the adult ed programming at your college, where the uh, where the books are paid for, you figure out cost sharing arrangements for making sure that there's no book fees uh, or tuitions, and and that tuition is waived and all of that. Next question is: Will there be a different different form than the K twelve form for adult ed? I would say you know none of that yes. is required, but yes, it, it really, um, there's a couple key differences. One is you're not working with minors, so you don't need the parent signature. Another key difference is just, you, you probably want your language to be welcoming and speak mm -hmm. to the adult ed students. Um, Laura's developed a really fabulous form for this purpose. It's actually, it's more simplified. Uh, the language is, is more simplified and um, it definitely is more welcoming. We're, we're much more cautious on the language that the college vernacular is not there. Um, the assumption is that the persons that are the adult school students have not, um, are not as familiar with some of the verbiage. Um, a person in high school may be a little bit more familiar with the terms units or, or major. They might be exposed to that a little bit more. So we're trying, we're very cautious with the language that we use, or we make sure that we're using language where we're providing an explanation. So it's more welcoming. It's, it's educating and welcoming at the same time. So we're not being, uh, we're not excluding anybody in the process or making them feel as if they're, um, they're not unsure, they're not sure of what they're going into. So we, we're very mindful of that as we are too with the high school students, but we're just being, we're very cautious of how we present our information. And yes, we can share this form. I can put the link in the chat. 
Um, somebody asked, I had students from the Philippines. They were told they had to pay international fees to attend community college. Any word on this? So if they're in the Philippines and they're in one of the adult ed programs and they're pursuing a, um, an adult secondary ed credential, then, I mean, if they're from the Philippines, it doesn't matter what their country of origin is from. If they are in that adult ed program in California, uh, then they are eligible for SB 554. It, um, it's just important. There are some visas that technically, um, like a B1 visa, for example, uh, where technically if they indicate that they are here on a B1 visa, they would not be eligible, uh, but There is a pathway to plaus. I'm being careful with my words. There's a pathway to plausible denial <laughs> if they indicate that they wish not to share their documentation. All right. If, um, you may have answered this, but I just want to ask it. If a student is in a HS HSE adult program, can they be dual enrolled in ESL classes at the college, or is it only particular classes they can be dual enrolled in? They can be dual enrolled in any classes that they are eligible for um, that don't don't have uh, prerequisites, you know, any of the typical college uh, requirements to get entry into a course. Um, they're all of the credit courses that any first time college student would be eligible for these students would also be eligible for. Thank you. And what have the responses been so far of districts to 554? It does require district approval, approval, correct? Yeah, it's really, uh, I think it's so new. Many districts are still trying to figure it out. Adult ed programs overwhelmingly are super excited. Um, a lot of our adult ed uh, partners um, around the state have reached out to the credit divisions in their college partners or even within their own college if they're non-credit adult ed providers and have actually been met with some resistance and or uh, lack of engagement. And so I think that's what's really valuable about a meeting like this is if you're in a dual, if you're a dual enrollment director, if you're on that credit division side and you are doing this partnership work, please uh, open, you know, open your arms to the adult ed providers and to your adult schools uh, to build these bridges because it's really important for the students that are in these programs. Mm -hmm. What's, I think what's also significant about the, uh, the, dual, the adult ed dual enrollment is we did a soft launch this semester and we're recruiting for spring. And I'm already seeing adults asking, adult school students asking about programs or options for their children. So we're, we're not only affecting the parents, but we're having an immediate impact on their kids because many of them have high school students. And so we're, it's, it's twofold there's an immediate impact on not just the individual, but the family as a whole. So we already know, those of us in education, we already know that we can affect a family. But I'm, I'm seeing, just anecdotally, I'm seeing that impact immediately. Um, and sometimes I'm having the student, a, a younger student, contact me for their, for their parent um, for attending, a, you know, I did an information session yesterday and I had a young adult contact me. He had, he had his mom fill out the application as well. He, he was a, a GED student at an adult school. So he's enrolling his mom at the adult school so she can attend both the GED program and Chafee College. And more significantly, um, was it last week, Matt? We, we had a student at one of our adult schools contacted Chafee to complain to let us know that there was a scam going on because Chafee College, that some there was a scam going on because it was too good to be true that their adult school 
was saying that they could take college classes for free. So they wanted to let us know that this was happening because it must have been a scam. So it was really funny. It made its way up to our adult school. I mean, to our help desk about this supposed scam. So it's 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 making its way. It's making its way around the community, and it's being heard, and the impact is being felt. So it's 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 significant. It's pretty exciting. That student exact there. That student's exact words were, "It's too good to be true." So it must be. Yeah. A, so the student legitimately just thought there was no way that that they would be given free access to college without yeah. having to jump through the normal hurdles that they have to jump through. Um, thank you. Another question we had is a student who's being, who's, who has being or been in California for a year, graduated from high school in let's say Mexico, can he or she enroll in adult ed and college? What is the sooner this student can become a what is the soonest this student can become an AB 540? So the AB 5, let's park the AB 540 piece um, and just deal with SB 554 in this scenario. If there's a student who has a high school diploma out of country, they can pursue, and they're now living in California, they can pursue a high school equivalency or high school diploma at an adult ed program in California. Mm -hmm. um, if they wish while they're pursuing that high school equivalency or high school diploma at an adult school to enroll as an SB 554 student at the college and with credit courses, they are fully eligible to do that with the adult school's uh, signature, indicating that, which is the verification that they're pursuing a high school equivalency or diploma. Okay, and then somebody asked, that I'm still not clear about the ESL question. Yes, AE students may enroll in ESL, but are those courses qualified as part of the ASE program? For example, no tuition charged. So yeah, I, I, I just typed in a quick response there just to kind of clarify um, regarding any, any sort of questions over the ESL sort of matrix and challenge there. Um, just the, the rule, the broad sort of rule and that that you can that you can follow is that any adult student pursuing a high school equivalency or high or high school diploma whether or not they're enrolled in esl or an adult ed non-credit cte um, is eligible for sb 554 special admit so the key piece is that they're pursuing high school equivalency or high school diploma if all if they're also co-enrolled in other types of programs such as esl that's totally legitimate I love that people are voting on other people's questions. So I, can I can I add, I just want to clarify. So my understanding was it was always, they have to be enrolled in a GED or high school diploma program at the adult school, right? That's they the have to be, that's the minimum. So if they can't be in ESL doing an ABE class, but not be enrolled in GED or high school diploma, because then they wouldn't qualify. That's my understanding, just clarifying that. That is correct. Correct. Thank you. All right. Um, so this is a question that we got two likes on. <laughs> um, does anyone have a copy of the item taken to their district board for approval to include SB 554 slash adult ed students as special admins under dual enrollment that they can share? So, yeah, so actually we have that we're, we're putting that through our board right now, so we can we can share it for sure. Um, I think Naomi, when we do the report, or the, the research, we can share it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the community of practice and base camp is a great place to um, uh, share those kinds of resources as well as other problem solving you know, challenges. So if folks want to be included in the dual enrollment uh, base camp community of practice, you drop your email address in the chat. We'll make sure to go back and, and invite you in. And it looks like uh, it looks like Foothill has theirs or provided theirs. Or sharing their emails. All right. So another question we have, this is great. Does the students have to, does the student have to be enrolled concurrently in a GED slash HSD program and the college or as long 
as the GDHSD is part of their educational plan at the adult school? Just as long as it's part of their educational plan at the adult school. And uh, the college, for, for aud again, like always, the, your admissions director's department is going to be concerned about auditing. And so it's that uh, designee signature from the adult school, which can be an electronic signature. That's going to be the verification for that student's enrollment in that program. All right. And then we have our last question. Um, this may have already been answered. Is there a standard or a template form that has been designed for the SB 540 special admin students equivalent to the college early start form? That would be helpful. Yeah, so I think that's the form that Laura um, shared the link for in the in the chat. That's that's our form. Every college uh, can develop their own form. There was one court college who Laura met with recently. Laura, what was that college that was going to actually did? They were going to create a bundled adult ed form, uh, a, a, an adult ed application for enrollment plus SB 554 agreement forms. So so yeah. So that was my friend Eric there, Eric, who just posed that last question about the uh, the uh, board, the item taken to the district board for approval. So Eric's over at, correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, West Valley? Yes. And he, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna brag on Eric a little bit. So they, he has several non-credit programs and they do a, uh, they do their application. So they don't use CC apply. They use, he has an application and he uses form stack so his application for the college and into his programs is a singular form that's embedded on his page. It is phenomenal. I, I mean, absolutely phenomenal. It is the most student-centered, student-friendly form I have ever seen. And Chafee is going to steal that as soon as we can and replicate it. It is amazing. Um, so. I'm going to direct everybody his way to get students enrolled. It's, it was it was absolutely amazing. So I, I can't take any. I'll, I'll send it there. It was it was pretty impressive the way it, it was. Everyone, so, put the link, Eric. <laughs> yeah, put the link, Eric. Okay, I'll do. It. I'll do it right now. <laughs> yeah, it was it was amazing. And he even said his enrollment went up dramatically because of that. Now, I know there's a lot more when you do it that way, there's a lot more work on the back end of having staff to do it, to do the inputting. But um, it was it was not only that, the way he addressed the questions were impressive as far as um, just, it, it was just how you guys have to take a look at it. It was just, it was extremely impressive and simplified. Thank you, Eric, for sharing that link. That is all in terms of the questions <laughs> that we have. I think I captured everybody's questions. So I'll hand it over to you all if you want to continue. And the recording and notes and everything will be shared. Um, I'll take over, Sherry. Thank you, Sherry. Um, thanks, everybody, for all the questions. They were all great. But this question goes out to Matthew and Laura. Um, you know what? since we didn't really actually answer some of these questions that are on this actual slide, you know, what could an ideal partnership look like? What is, a po what is possible? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is an absolute, it's interesting because so many of the questions have been more on the technical side. We haven't stepped into that space uh, as a community of practice um, across the state of sort of you know, exploring, wow, like what is really possible uh, with this type of legislation in terms of how many uh, barriers it removes and the partnerships that it potentially can create uh, with, with between, a, especially I think between adult schools and colleges, because the linkages and bridges between adult schools and colleges are really, are tend to be really thin. And I think CAPE has helped uh, shore that up a little bit, but this legislation formalizes those bridges because it does require the signature of the adult school administrator or designee. And so um, I'm, I'm actually interested in seeing from the group 
uh, if you can put in the chat um, some of your ideas for you know what what is possible for what kind of uh, special partnerships you've developed between your adult ed programs and the college uh, and in, in relation to this kind of uh, legislation, or if you haven't developed it yet, what ideas you have for what you might develop. So if you could put those in the chat and then we, we may uh, sort of call on you to unmute you to hear some of your ideas. While people are putting things in the Saddleback is creating pathways to our CTE programs. I'm wondering if we could unmute Sue Donaldson and uh, and ask her if she could talk a little bit about the work she's doing. I believe she could unmute herself. Go ahead, Sue. Okay, hi, good morning, everybody. We're excited at Saddleback College and we're just thrilled. One of the things we're doing right now is working closely with our Dean of CTE um, because we all need to become more familiar with the low commitment unit courses or programs that, that yield high career placement. And so our counselors will be very, very, uh, very instrumental in this. And our counselors have had to really pivot to learn about and survey and inventory all our CTEs, as well as taking inventory of the needs, a needs assessment of our current student population. So we're, we're just thrilled. It's been a real process for us at Saddleback. It's been a multidisciplinary team creating this process between admissions and records, a counseling department, uh, matriculation, uh, of course, our team, and also marketing and communication. So what, what we need to do now is inform our entire campus community. For example, we have three part-time counselors dedicated to our adult education program that's been really, really walking closely with us and developing these processes. But one of the full-time um, general counselors received a call about this. And then the Dean of Counseling said, hey, so you got to get in there and let them know all about this program. So it's a, now it's about informing our campus, community, administration, all of our counselors on campus, as well as the surrounding community. Thanks so much, Sue. And I think you brought up a really key point to a major difference between traditional high school dual enrollment and maybe perhaps what this will look like in SB 554 is there'll be a lot more focus on those shorter term credit CTE pathways to make sure that students are able to imme immediately see returns on their investment on the credit side. Um, real quickly, I, I want to uh, ask uh, Sharon, if you're in the room to announce uh, your webinar um, on adult dual enrollment, if you, uh, if you, if you can, if you can do that, because that would be super valuable, I think, to the group. Uh, Sharon Turner has left, but we are having this as part of our Bay Region Dual Enrollment Exchange. Sharon put the information in, and we would welcome all of you to come. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So it looks like uh, we're we're at that time mark for wrap up. Uh, Adair, you want to take it? From um, yes, I'll take it from here, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Laura, um, for you know presenting today at our webinar. Um, I don't know if we can get our slides back up on Naomi, please. There we go. Let's move on to the next slide. Awesome. So our resources are actually, a lot of our resources are actually located on our Career Ladders Project website. You could also find, you know, online on onboarding, um, moving to an electronic form. The community of practice for Basecamp, um, like we said earlier, this is a, you know, a space where all of you guys can share information. You guys answer each other back and forth. Um, I will ask for forgiveness because I'm the one in charge of the base camp. So I've been a little behind in adding people, but I'll try to add most people by Friday afternoon. And then also on our COP um, website, you can find information on our cloud computing um, workforce as well. And uh, I, from the chat, I, it seems like a lot of this information has already been uploaded on the chat. And a lot of the files have been uploaded as well on the chat. Next slide, please. And then resources for onboarding, this actually has been uploaded to the chat. I already saw it uploaded twice, but uh, if you need more of this information as well, you can also go to our Career Ladders Project website. And next slide. 
Um, thank you, everybody. Um, before we go, we do have a poll. If you have time before you get off, there is a poll. You could actually try to answer these questions before you go. And I would like to say thank you, everybody, for coming on with us today. Awesome. A lot of people are answering this before they get off. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Laura. Um, if you need anything from us, you can email um, Dr. Castro at Naomi Castro at careerlivesproject.org. And I believe that is it for all of us today. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Matthew, can you put your email in the chat? Do you mind?